Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session on Advanced System D for the embedded use case. Um, I've decided to do this presentation after discussing with various people at ELC last year about System D for the embedded use case and realizing that most of the people I know and who are more or less working in the embedded world don't know system D enough to really use it uh, at its best. I mean, system D is a very uh, advanced tool with lots of features and you pay a cost for this fe so for these features and it's really a shame not to use them because they really are useful in the embedded use case and will greatly simplify writing our uh, code and in particular all the dedicated code that uh, can't be reused between projects so just a little word about what i'm going to say in general um because of obviously time constraints uh, i will not this will not be a tutorial I'll, this is, will be more like a feature list i will just say all the things that uh, system d can do for you and uh, if you really want to know uh, how to do it we, we can have a talk af after that or just go to the man pages system d has a uh, very good man pages um, I'm from the embedded world, but the embedded industrial world, not mobile phones, not the um, IoT. Well, I do a little bit of IoT, but that won't be the subject of this talk. So that's a limit on the point of view I have and the kind of problem I solve. And another thing to know is that I'm someone that knows uh, System D really well. And actually, I teach System D uh, professionally. Uh, but I'm also um, an expert on projects, on embedded projects that are using systemd. So when I will say that the feature is easy to use, it usually means that I end up explaining that feature to people and people get it right away and use it correctly. And I ne never hear from them again. And when I say a feature is, is a bit harder to use, it usually means that when I explain the thing, people have a little a problem and I need to do a little intervention to get things working. So some stuff are useful, but a bit harder to use, and some stuff are really easy. I wanted to do some uh, metrics and measures. I've done a little th through this presentation, very few. Um, just you see my system around there. It's pretty simple. It's a minimal build route with basically nothing in it, no useful soft software started. Um, I went from using System 5 to System D, and uh, the image grew from 9 megs to 17 megs. So that's a back of the envelope metric of how much space System D costs. I wanted to measure boot times, but it turned out not to be really significant because most of the boot time on a, such a simple system was DHCP and network time synchronization and nothing really relevant. So there we go. So um, this talks will be in three short, well, three parts. Uh, first part about what I call headline features, which is things you probably know System D can do for you, but we'll go a little bit deeper into it to show how good it is for the embedded use case. Hidden gems are features that, well, unless you really know System D, you probably don't know, and which can really, really save you time. And then I'll go around to discuss some features of System D, which are pretty useful, but usually not for us, not for the embedded people. So I'll give a quick word about why they are here and why I usually disable, disable them. And if relevant, why sometimes I use them anyway. So the first thing is probably, I think the most important thing with System D is that when you start a daemon with System D, you have a very, very uh, fine grained and very easy to set up environment for your daemon. So when you start a process under a Linux system, there are all sorts of st stuff you can set up for the process. There are the ones everybody know about, like environment var variables, what user, what group to use. Uh, some people will uh, set up some uh, limits with R limit and that sort of tools and that sort of stuff. But there is actually way more you can set up. And most of, those, of these things are considered advanced by most users, hard to set up, and usually are not set up at all. With systemd, those things are easy to do. And that's the main point. I mean, if you want, 
Let's start by the standard file descriptors. If you have a system five in its script, where does the standard out and the standard error of your daemon go? Nobody knows. If you're lucky, it will go to dev null. Most of the time, it will go to whatever standard output is con configured, which will be the console. Some people, some startup scripts uh, redirect it to files, which is not good either. With systemd, you just have uh, one parameter which allows you to uh, set up the most standard cases for this uh, standard file descriptor. It's like put it in it to syslog, uh, putting it to, to the journal, which is a uh, default, uh, sending it to dev null. Uh, for the input, you can uh, give a character string or some binary data which will be fed to your program and so on and so forth. So it's really easy to set up. Uh, there are some more advanced things that most people don't know how to set up, but systemd can set them up for you again easily. So that would be stuff like uh, Linux capabilities. So you can run your program as root with limited power. Syscall filtering, which can uh, forbid your daemon from doing some system calls. Um, there is all sorts of setups with regard to what I call file system masking, which is the allowing your daemon to only access some parts at, of the file system. And that's not Unix permissions. That's actually using bind mounts and um, mount namespaces to limit what your uh, daemon can do. And all sorts of advanced features like forbidding a daemon to uh, load kernel modules through various layers of securities and stuff like that. So all this thing are, um, are things that are easy to set up with systemd and can be checked globally with systemd. Systemd has a very good security analysis tool, which will take all the demons on your, well, all the services to use the correct term on your system and will check for, with every one of them uh, what security uh, feature are enabled and what fe security feature are disabled. So doing an audit is easy and something you can do. And that's the main point. You can really control, you can really um, do a, a jail for your uh, daemon and you can do it easily through ve a very simple configuration. Some of this stuff is really tricky to do. So we're talking a little bit about security. So this is not a security talk, but it's important to understand where um, systemd fits in the security uh, model. So uh, when you're securing a daemon, you have two layers of security and both of which are very important but totally different. So the first layer is your da daemon itself. The daemon must uh, validate its input, it must uh, work correctly and in general nobody should be able to use it to do things that it is allowed to do but should not do. An example would be a database. A database is allowed to erase all data but it shouldn't do it. So that's writing a correct application. That's not where systemd acts in terms of security. Systemd uh, acts at the second layer. It's more the idea that your daemon has been corrupted. There is a, a malevolence somewhere that took complete com control of it. Systemd is here to make sure that it cannot do more than what the daemon is theoretically uh, allowed to do. So how does it do it? It configures the kernel. It does not do any security check itself. It just configure all the security mechanism of the kernel. And those mechanism are extremely powerful, but most of them are hard to, uh, to set up. I mean, if anybody has read the man page for namespaces or for capabilities, those are extremely hard to understand. I mean, take some time. Once you've wrapped your head around it, you can uh, figure out how it's going on, but it's really, really hard. With systemd, using those mechanisms is really easy. Some very high level constraints are trivial to do. You want your daemon to have a read-only view on the whole file system, you just tell systemd to do so, and it will be done. Uh, you want your daemon to uh, be run with the no new privilege flag, it's one line in systemd. Systemd is helping with security not because it's uh, foolproof, very well coded. Well, I think it is, but that's not the main point. The main point is all those security features are really easy to set up, and that's a huge gain. 
So that was your daemon. You configure it, you start it, and you control everything uh, in its environment so you can uh, secure it and jail it and have it uh, well controlled. Now, the other uh, aspect where system D is really important it's, is all the synchronization things and starting the daemons in the right order and having a startup logic and restarting daemons. This part is a bit tricky. That's a part where I usually have to come back and uh, give a few tips after the fact. But overall, once you get it working, when you, once you understand the actual logic, it's extremely powerful. When you have bugs, bugs tend to be easy to reproduce and so easy to debug. And when you have uh, complex use cases for restarting daemons, that's where uh, systemd really shines. Uh, it's when, when you're in an embedded system, your system needs to take care of itself. There is no admin, there is no uh, crashed instances that are um, replaced by other instances. Your, your system is on its own. It has to detect when things go wrong. It has to deal with things going wrong on its own. And that's where systemd really helps you because this whole logic of robustness of not crashing or, or, of, or or of restarting automatically when sync crashes. This whole logic, you don't have to write it. You don't have to write a single line of code in your daemon. Well, you have to write one line, the one to tell the watchdog you're still alive. So everything else systemd can um, do for you. First, it has a very robust startup logic. It's a logic that has been uh, written to deal with all the various logics that um, Unix daemons have had throughout time, like stuff like privilege dropping, uh, like uh, daemons that uh, fork or not don't fork. Uh, all that sort of stuff is uh, something uh, systemd is used to deal with, and everything is protected with timeout. So you will never have a daemon which will be completely stuck because systemd is watching it. It has some great system for readiness detection. So what is readiness detection? The idea is when you start your daemon, uh, the moment you start the process is not the moment when the daemon is ready to work. It needs some time to prepare. So you want your daemon's dependency to start a bit later. Okay, so Systemd has various ways to uh, to detect readiness, but the most useful one, especially when you write your own daemon, so you know you will be using Systemd, is to just tell Systemd. So that you have one call in the Systemd app API, one function you call it, and that will tell Systemd you're ready, and Systemd will synchronize any dependencies on that signal. So it's one line of C code or whatever binding you like to use in your native language to get it working. It's pretty easy. You can easily ask systemd to run scripts before your daemon. And since the pre-start scripts are part of the service, you are guaranteed that they will always be run correctly. You can also have post-start daemons. So those are scripts, post-start scripts. Those are scripts that will be run by systemd after your daemon has said it is ready, but before dependencies are started. So that's really handy when you have some cleanups. And boy, you I, I don't know about you, but in the embedded world, we have some very badly written daemons. So having that sort of tools is really awesome. Um, watchdogs, systemd provides you with a um, software watchdog. So systemd itself will uh, feed the hardware watchdog. So uh, if the kernel crashes, the hardware watchdog will not be fed. If systemd crashes, the hardware watchdog will not be fed. And then systemd itself provide uh, software watchdogs for any application that needs it. So if your daemon is um, is coded for systemd, you have one line of code you have to add in your main loop. And that's it. And your watchdog will be working and systemd will monitor your application. And if your application does not uh, feed its watchdog in time, systemd will stop it and restart it in a very well-defined way. Again, with all the time outs you want. If you wanted to restart uh, the whole machine, you can do that too. And 
the whole logic is here and uh, ready to go. Uh, you can uh, configure a restart uh, very precisely, uh, including uh, grace periods if you need it and burst protection. So uh, restarts, uh, so grace periods is basically you tell systemd I want my daemon to uh, wait a couple of um, seconds before being restarted and systemd will guarantee you you have that couple of se seconds. That's pretty good when you have some hardware that needs some time to restart but you cannot detect it. And burst protection is basically the idea of saying to systemd, I want this daemon to be restarted as soon as possible. But if it restarts more than 10 times in a five minute window, just kill it. So the whole thing is a little tricky to understand. As I said, you have to understand the whole uh, mechanism, but once you get it going, you have a very, well-defined dependency system, ordering system. You can have a very uh, precise control of how, when, and in what order your various demons are started. And again, it's really good to um, not just having a faster boot, we'll dis discuss boot time a little bit later, but really, um, unlike uh, system five, you have a real understanding on on what's going on and it's really easy to get it bulletproof as in your system will never be stuck i mean it might reboot it might restart demons but you have someone who's actually monitoring everything making things just work at the as they need and has very precise instructions to what to do in every case so not only is your daemon really easier to write because you don't need to do the cleanup yourself, you don't need to drop privileges yourself, you don't even need to fork yourself anymore, but the whole thing is configurable by the sysadmin if you need to tweak it. And it's overall uh, working really well. So, even if a system D is first and foremost a system to monitor your demons, it's in charge of boot. So in that regard, a system D has a few not well-known features that are really great for us embedded people. So the first one, and probably one of the most important one, is boot blessing. So that's a rather new feature, but basically there is a point in system D where uh, we decide if a boot is successful or not. And what's really great is that this is a neutral point which is independent of hardware, independent of the distro you're using, and independent of the, of the over-the-air upgrade system you're using. So you can add any test you, you want before that point, which will uh, influence boot blessing in a neutral way that can be reused from product to product without anything specific to any hardware. And on the other hand, you can also add script after that point that are specific to your bootloader, your um, over-the-air system, and it will take into account any script that comes before the boot blessing, which are again neutral. So it's it's very good because you can do those tricky boot blessing things in a neutral way. Um, so when system D boot, it has a boot target. So without going very far into detail, it's basically the same thing as a run level. Okay. Um, system D has those um, boot targets and you can have multiple boot targets. And that's really handy because in the embedded world, it's very common that we want to boot in different ways, depending on various criteria, the most common being um, production boot versus uh, development versus factory test and so on and so forth. Uh, not only uh, can you have multiple boots, but system D has this uh, control called system control isolate, which allow you to uh, switch mode on a live system, including uh, stuff like blacklisting, blacklisting some services, uh, to avoid them um, being uh, being uh, killed when you change uh, mode, if you have, I don't know, a watchdog or something like that. So the whole thing is pretty handy and pretty um, versatile, so you can use it in any way you want. Uh, one of the very good thing uh, with System Day is you have some very precise boot time analysis tool. 
which know how systemd starts things and will take uh, parallel uh, startups into account and tell you really what you're um, looking for. So um, reducing boot time is a very, very common problem in the embedded world. And we usually do a lot of guessing in this area. Uh, with systemd, no more guessing. You have a real tool which will tell you what demons you've been waiting for and what demons have been long to start, but you have not actually been waiting for them, so you're perfectly fine and you don't need to optimize those. And usually the first time you use those tools, you have some surprise because time is not spent when, where you think it is. Last uh, thing I really like is generators. So generators are small binaries, runnables, that systemd will uh, execute very early in the boot process. And their job is to generate new uh, configuration files for systemd, new units. So that's pretty handy for us in the embedded world because a very common thing we're asked to do is to have one hardware and multiple products and to detect on one product we are and boot differently or uh, multiple hardware with one image because they have the same CPU and we need to detect what image we're on and uh, boot differently. So we usually do that using CPU IDs or some uh, hardwired GPIOs who tell us what we are. Uh, generators are typically, well, I've used them a couple of, the, of times to read GPIO and uh, decide what services needed to be started or to choose a boot target, okay? Once I had also a customer that wanted everything to be configured with a single XML file, and that included starting multiple services in different ways. So I had to write an XML parser that would generate a systemd uh, configuration file. So writing, uh, uh, dealing with a XML was hard, but actually getting systemd to do what I wanted was easy. Small um, side comment uh, about systemd and why it boots faster. So I was not able to get relevant boot times, but most people agree nowadays that uh, systemd actually uh, gain you uh, boot time. Uh, but the question of why is rarely answered or at least not answered correctly. So. The first reason is parallelization. So that's a well-known reason. Systemd starts uh, all demons uh, that can be started in parallel. It, all those demons will be started simultaneously. So that's really good at saturating both CPU and disks uh, to the point that uh, Systemd used to have read ahead to preload uh, pages in memory. And they've dropped this because the uh, disk um, the IO bus was saturated anyway, so you didn't get, gain any time by doing that. Um, so that's the first and most well-known um, boot, time, boot uh, time optimization in systemd. Second one is socket-based dependencies, which basically means that if you have a daemon that writes in a socket, the socket need to be created before the daemon uh, can be started. Uh, however, if another daemon reads that socket, it does the reader does not need to be started right away. And systemd deals with that. That, the, that means systemd can create the socket for you and start both the writer and the reader at the same time and use the socket as a sort of cache between the two to allow, allow those to start in parallel. That's particularly useful with syslog and or journaldy because those uh, do not block all demons that need to write to the syslog. Uh, systemd has a very uh, robust uh, on-demand uh, startup system, which means that demons will be started only when they are needed. And that includes not starting demons that are uh, irrelevant for your particular hardware. So I don't know if you remember booting on old uh, Ubuntu like uh, five to 10 years ago, but you would have cups be started, you would have Sane be started, and they would be started even if you did not have printer or a scanner. Those days, I don't know if anybody noticed, but those days are gone. Even on um, a rich desktop distributions, a Sane is not started anymore. Why? Because systemd waits to see if there is a scanner before deciding to start the daemon. So as a consequence, you have much less demons that are started at boot because useless demons are not started. And last, um, when you're starting, uh, when you're 
init system is based on shell scripts, you start a lot of shells. You start a lot of subshells, and you start a lot of commands. I mean, whenever you want to change permission on a, on a file, or uh, when you want to uh, change user, you have to launch a command. And it, starting a process on Linux is, well, fast, but it still has a cost. And systemd does all the setup for your daemon, the environment I've mentioned in my first slide. It does all this by calling directly the system calls and not by starting processes that are just started to start a system call. And the number of processes started is significantly less on systemd. On my minimal system with nothing on it that just started a shell, I had um, the PID of the first shell after startup was, was 72 with systemd and 155 with a system 5 in its script. And again, nothing was started. It was just starting those shell. So that's why I, I think that um, systemd uh, will, uh, is faster at startup. So those are... Uh, mainline features of systemd, but features that are really um, useful for us in the embedded world, and I would say especially for us in the embedded world. I'm going now to move on to some features that most people probably have not heard of, but are still really uh, useful for us. So the first one is the one everybody loves to hate, it's journal D. So logs, uh, Let's just put it that way. In the embedded world, we don't really like logs. Uh, they clutter our file, our file systems. They uh, eat our flash drives. And on an embedded system that will end up under the sea or in a car or uh, on a plane, nobody will ever read the logs because we don't have any sysadmins. We don't have any log centralization. And so, most of the time, uh, logs are a real problem. Uh, journal D helps a lot with logs. So the first thing which makes Journal D awesome is that it's, it's exhaustive. I mean, every kind, well, except for uh, applications that write directly in their own log files, everything else end up in the journal. So every D, uh, Every daemon started by systemd, unless you configure them differently explicitly, will have its standard out and standard errors into the journal. Everything that goes through syslog will end up in the journal. Any kernel message, so what you usually get with dmessage, will end up in the journal. Audit end up in the journal. And if you use containers, I well, never use containers in embedded systems, but you never know. If you use containers, all your container messages can end up in the same journal, the journal of the host, which means that you have them centralized for free. The, th the next thing with the journal, which makes it really awesome, is that it collects metadata. So if you use traditional syslog, you only get um, one line of text per message. And that line of text may contain timestamps. It may contain PID. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't even contain the name of the person that generated the log. Uh, with system D, uh, well, with journal D, journal will collect every possible metadata it uh, knows about, and some of them are really great. The first one, which is really awesome, is reliable timestamps. So journal D will uh, collect uh, its own timestamps when it gets a message, and will thus keep all message from all demons in one consistent order, which is the real order. That's pretty awesome. And as a reminder, I said earlier that journal D collects a message from all containers which means that all your containers are in the same journal with reliable timestamps. So everything is perfectly ordered between containers. It stores a boot ID which it, with uh, every message. So the boot ID is basically a random string that is generated at boot and that is used to uniquely it identify the boot of your machine. So which means that you can just get all the message from a particular boot easily. 
you also get all process information. So PID of your process, command line of your process, UIDs that launched your process, what capabilities your process had at the time, and so forth and so on. There's all sorts of stuff. It's pretty useful. Um, the next thing that's really cool for us in the embedded world is that JournalD is not just here to collect logs and write them down in files. It actually has a complete API which allows you to control it. So one thing we commonly have to do in embedded systems which have a user interface, so one with a screen or something like, like that, is have some sort of debug menu where you can scroll and view the logs. Uh, with JournalD, you have an API which allows you to, uh, to search the logs, to uh, see the logs continuously. You have a poll aware mechanism. This poll aware mechanism, you can give it filters, so you will only be woken when um, a given type of message arrives. Uh, you can um, find where you were last time when you restart, so which, me which means that your um, log vis visualization log visualization tool can catch up if it crashes. So your uh, log tool is monitored by systemd, it crashes, it restarts, it's reconnecting to the journal, it will get all the message it, it missed while it was down. And that's for free, it's easy to do. This is an area where I just told someone, you have this API, API, go look into it, and then the application was working. You can store uh, any extra data you want in the journal when you're stock storing a message, not just one line of text, including binary data. So uh, the system, the people use this uh, feature, the fact that you can store binary data with messages to store core dumps inside the journal. I'm personally not convinced it's a great idea, but it can be done. What is great is that you can store uh, any binary data in the journal, and I usually use it to store faulty bus frames. I, when you uh, debug a system, and when you debug a, a system uh, in a real environment, commonly you, uh, you're not here. You just give your system to uh, a mechanic, the mechanic will put it in the car, the car will go and run around a circuit for hours, and then it comes back and you have to see what has been going on. So with this kind of tool, you can just store any faulty frame you find inside the journal and get it with all the traces, again, with timestamps that allow you to see all the messages your application has produced before and after detecting the problem. Uh, JournalD has um, a network protocol um, option, so it's optional. You don't have to uh, compile it in, but if you do, it's pretty awesome. Uh, traditional uh, syslog is um, a traditional syslog protocol is just put the message in a UDP um, packet and send the packet. So you have no integ well, you have integrity because it's TCP, because it's IP. But you don't have guarantees that the message will arrive. You have no guarantee of the order and you have no timestamps to, um, to uh, correct the order. So usually it's used in a data center where the network is reliable, but you could never use that sort of protocol over the internet. Uh, JournalD comes with its own uh, web client slash web server, which allows you to easily uh, fetch or push the logs um, around an HTTPS based stack. So it's really easy to put in place. It's all, it's, it has already been done to, for you. You can use certificates to guarantee that only allowed people can get into the log. And it even uh, integrates a very simple, uh, very light uh, web page, which allows you to uh, browse the, um, your logs directly on your machine. So if you need a one-off uh, log visualization tool, uh, something simple, you have zero development to do, you just use a uh, system days uh, integrated uh, web server and you get the logs. And if you don't want it, you just don't compile it. And last, in the, in the embedded world, we tend to, um, to have uh, file rotation issues. So we have some very complex logic about how many files we are allowed to keep, how, what size they, have, they must have, how old they can be. Um, JournalD has a very, very uh, uh, complete 
uh, file rotation configuration and will basically uh, uh, deal with anything you can throw at it. So just go for it. Uh, that's a solved problem for me. So journal D, as far as I'm concerned, has solved all the log problems I have when doing embedded systems. And in particular, uh, all the things linked to having an API, which makes things way, way, way simpler. Something I love about systemd is that you have complete dbus piloting. So everything systemd can do, you can command it through dbus. So that means that you, uh, you can monitor uh, your system through dbus. And uh, systemd will send you a dbus signal when a unit change state. So you can monitor units and have your nice little green and red lights on your UI simply by monitoring systemd and looking at the um, at uh, unit states uh, and the monitoring application can itself be monitored by system which is pretty awesome uh, you want to have uh, to restart a service with a button on your ui well the button just send a dbus message to systemd and systemd is very good at restarting services so it's pretty trivial to, to do uh, any property uh, is uh, available through dbus and those that can be dynamically changed you can change them through dbus and that includes all control group settings so i didn't go into control group earlier but basically it allows you to control how much cpu how much memory a given service has available so you can change that dynamically through system d and uh, you can then pilot all this through dbus so when you need to interact well with the system in general, uh, you do it through Dbus. I mean, all uh, major um, system uh, demons uh, uh, nowadays have a Dbus API, and so does systemd. But systemd is pretty interesting because it controls the system. So you can restart, uh, reboot through a Dbus uh, API, restart any uh, demons through a Dbus API, change how the demons work through a Dbus API. It's really easy. And again, something that people learn very fast. You have to understand systemd to do Dbus piloting, but once you do it, it's extremely complete and it solves all sorts of real life problems. In the embed the, the world, we have all sorts of problem with file system and partition management. Uh, so to give you a few, uh, usually we are asked to do uh, file system, uh, well, uh, system images that are as, as small as possible because of um, flashing time in factory. Uh, and usually you, we want uh, to uh, partition and uh, create our uh, data partitions on first boot. We also usually have A, B type uh, update, upgrade systems, which means that the whole da data is copied twice on bus, which takes a lot of time in factory. So we want the system to create its second partition on first boot. So there are all sorts of cases and systemd provides some great tools to help us with that problem. So the first one is uh, systemd can uh, detect what partition goes where and mount them correctly based on a GPT header. So GPT is a um, replacement for the, all the BIOS partition tables. Uh, and you can encode in there with what each partition is for. And systemd will be, detect this automatically. Uh, the latest version of systemd have um, a new daemon called partd. And partd will look at a couple of um, configuration file. And if it finds so, that some partitions are missing, it can create them and it can create them dynamically with constraints like just take all space available. So it's pretty easy to have partition created that will take whatever disk space we have. And that's pretty important because in the embedded world, usually you have new version of the product with only within which the only difference is the, the size of uh, the disk. So having a system that can grow its, inside its, um, its disk is pretty awesome. Uh, systemd can detect when a partition is not formatted and format it automatically. And it can also uh, detect when a, um, a partition is empty and it can populate it automatically. So that's pretty awesome. Again, either for our AB use case 
are more commonly in the embedded system when you have a data partition, but you need to have stuff in the data partition. You just leave your hard disk empty and with a properly configured systemd, systemd will create the data partition, format the data partition, initialize the data partition for you. So this really solves uh, a problem because FSTAB is complicated to handle, especially in Yocto, where we hate to have to write files. Uh, FSTAB is one file, you can't do drop it. Uh, portable services are also pretty awesome, so I'll try to be a bit faster on those ones. Portable service basically allows you to have binaries, all its libraries, all its configuration files in one single uh, file system image. So it allows you, allows you to have um, packages in one file uh, without having the risk of having a, a normal package system like Debian has, uh, which breaks systems to make it sim simply. So you ha can have all these images and services in one single file. And this way you, you can easily remove them if you need to do a factory reset. So portable services allows us to have a cheap, poor man's uh, packaging system without paying the price and having the danger of a full uh, blown packaging system. That's for my favorite features in systemd. So one quick slide on the features I do not use in embedded system. So the first one I would like to mention is NetworkD. So NetworkD is a network configuration tool. So it serves the same purpose as a network manager or conman, except that NetworkD is really uh, around the use case of um, having interfaces appearing and disappearing dynamically, which is typically what happens with containers that are started and stopped. So we usually don't use containers that much in the embedded world. So network D is really not practical for our complex use cases. And I usually use something like uh, conman. I usually disable login D home D because, and per user system D sessions, because those are all things that are linked to human users. And we use uh, dedicated um, UIDs for security purposes in the embedded world to separate security domains, but we generally do not have human users that need a shell or things like that. So I disable those features. And spawn, again, very little use for containers in the embedded world. So uh, nspawn is not really useful for that. Systemd boot is a very good tool, but it's only for EFI systems. And in the embedded world, we usually don't have EFI systems. We have U-boot based systems. So it's not that useful. And systemd in the init RAM disk, because we are in a RAM disk when we have them are usually pretty trivial and are simpler to uh, write in shell. So, this is why I think systemd is really great in the embedded world. It makes easy, it makes it way easier to write a daemon because a daemon is just a normal application, no forking, no uh, complex configuration of your system. Systemd can do um, everything for you. Uh, systemd uh, allows you to monitor and to secure your daemon e easily. And systemd allows you to interact with the system easily, being changing the network configuration, reading the logs, writing to the, into the logs, debugging, all those things you have great tools if you take the time to learning. So, th so that would be my general advice with systemd is take the time to learn. It's really worth it to have one person in your team that really understands and uh, masters systemd. He will write all the services you need and it will really, really simplify your main application. And that's the big gain. Things are simple. Securing is simple. It's robust. And robust is really the number one thing we want in embedded systems. Thank you very much.